We're reaching um, halfway point, alhamdulillah. So we only have half more to go. And so this is not the time to, you know, slack off or get lazy, right? To make sure that we are, inshallah, pushing through till the end. Um, okay, Ajara, Jazakallah khair, inshallah, we'll check that. So let's inshallah begin with our dua. <clears throat> um, Malaika, yes, definitely, um, inshallah. And that is uh, rewarding as well because we want to understand what the Quran is saying. So yes, definitely. Okay, okay. just a uh, and everyone, inshallah, we'll um, take care of the quiz issue. Okay, so let's inshallah begin with our du'a for today. نَحْمُوا سَلِيَ لَا رَسُولِهِ الْكَرِيمِ أَمَّا بَعْدْ فَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ رَبِ اشْرَحْ لِي صَدِّي وَيَسْرِ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْأُقْدَةَ مِنْ لِسَانِي يَقْوَلُ رَحْمَنِي Okay, so did we plant a lot of trees yesterday? <laughs> Everyone landscaped, inshallah, their plots in paradise. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so let's not forget to continue that, inshallah. The more thicker, the more lush, inshallah. Okay, so today's uh, dua is very short, and I'm sure all of you know it, so it's more of a reminder, inshallah, to remind ourselves of these words and uh, how amazing they are. And they are, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. There is no power nor strength except with Allah. MashaAllah, <laughs> barakallahu feekum. So two ahadith that I'm going to share, inshallah, about these words. Abu Huraira radiallahu an said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi said to me, be frequent in saying, there is no might or power except by Allah. For verily, it is a treasure from the treasures of paradise. Okay, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi told Abu Huraira radiallahu an to be frequent in saying these, okay, to say them often, because 
They are a treasure from the treasures of Jannah. Right? So subhanAllah, the treasures of Jannah have been given to us in this world. Right? And what is it? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So let's look at the next hadith to fully understand the meaning. And Muslim, meaning Sahih Muslim, reported a narration by Umar radiallahu an regarding the virtue of repeating what the Mu'addin pronounces word by word, except when the Mu'addin says, Hayya ala salah and Hayya ala al-fala. Come to the prayer and come to success. One should say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no might and no power except with the help of Allah. Okay, so when the adhan is called, what is the etiquette of the adhan? What are we supposed to do? Chit chat, stay quiet. What are we supposed to do when the adhan is being called? Yes, repeat. Okay, repeat the words. Good. Listen and repeat. And then when the imam, I'm sorry, the muazzin, meaning the one calling the adhan says, hayal al-salah and hayal al-fala. What are we supposed to say at that time? We're supposed to say these words. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Barakah fikum, mashallah. Right, so every time the muazzin calls, he says, Allahu Akbar, we say Allahu Akbar. Right? Whatever he says, we repeat. Except for when the Mu'azzin says, Hayya ala salah and Hayya ala al-fala. When he says, come to the prayer and come to success, we say, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Now, why? Why do we say this? Why do we say there is no might and no power except with the help of Allah when he calls, come to the prayer and come to success? Because... SubhanAllah, without the help of Allah, we will not be able to stand up for Salah. Yes, exactly. Barakallah fikum. Okay, exactly, because it is only He who can bring us to Salah, SubhanAllah. So the fact that we're able to pray to Allah, SubhanAllah ta'ala, to able to stand up and pray, that itself, SubhanAllah, is a blessing from Allah, SubhanAllah ta'ala. Right? And when we are standing up to pray, subhanAllah, are we thinking that this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or are we thinking, oh, it's something I have to go do. I have to just get this obligation off my shoulders, subhanAllah. Right? We forget, right? That even the ability to pray salah is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all the power and he's allowing us to pray to him. Yes, it's an honorable gift, exactly. Right? So there's no might and no power except with Allah. Yes, it's tawfiq. So subhanAllah, the next time I remember that I need to pray, right? Whether it's getting up for Fajr prayer or praying our Ishaf, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, remember that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is allowing us to pray. It's not that I have the power and I have the ability to pray. It's that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing me to pray. Right? He's given me life. He's given me a chance, subhanAllah, where I can worship him and reap the benefits in Jannah. Right? So now that we understand how powerful these words are, right? then we go back to the first hadith where the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Hurairah radiallahu an to be frequent in saying, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Right? So that means we keep reminding ourselves that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has all of the power. And whatever I'm able to do, the fact that I'm able to breathe, the fact that I'm able to get up and walk, the fact that I'm able to, subhanAllah, be here right now in class, it is all la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helped us. Right? So we should continuously remind ourselves of this, be frequent in saying this, and it is a treasure from the treasures of Jannah. Right? And so someone who has a treasure of Jannah has to enter Jannah, right? Has to be able to, subhanAllah, get to that place. Right? Because we've already got a piece of it. 
Okay, so let's inshallah hold on to this piece of um, Jannah and continue to benefit ourselves from it. You know what I mean? Okay, so very, very um, quick and easy breakdown. Okay, Barakallah Bikum. Yes, Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah Khair. So, la, not, hawla, any power, wala, and not, quwata, any strength, illa, except, billah, with Allah. Okay, so, la, hawla, wala, quwata, illa, billah. So, let's inshallah make it a point to recite this often today and inshallah throughout whenever we remember. Alhamdulillah, so we are on Juz 19, mashallah. Okay, so are you all ready? Shall we begin? Yes, okay. Alhamdulillah. So let's start. Uh, mashallah, Juz 19 with Sister Damia. Bismillah. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم اهد قلبي وسدد لساني واسلل سخيمة قلبي آمين يا رب العالمين جزء نمبر 19 سورة الفرقان وقال الذين لا يرجون لقاءنا لولا أنزل علينا الملائكة أو نرى ربنا لقد استكبروا في أنفسهم وعتوا عتوا كبيرا And those who do not expect the meeting with us say Why were not angels sent down to us? Or why do we not see our Lord? They have certainly become arrogant within themselves and become insolent with great insolence. We see in this verse that people who do not believe in the hereafter, who do not even imagine or expect that they will one day meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
Such people demand that if God is there, then how come we do not see him? That if angels come down to the messenger, how come they don't come down to us and tell us that he is the messenger of Allah? Or in fact, tell us directly what is being conveyed to us through the messenger. So it is made clear here that such people do not make such demands out of a genuine need or reason. They're actually demonstrating great pride. They're being very audacious and bold. They're not asking this from a place of genuine curiosity, but from a place of arrogance, from a place of denial and contempt. يَوْمَ يَرَوْنَ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَا بُشْرَى يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُجْرِمِينَ وَيَقُولُونَ حِجْرًا مَحْجُورًا The day they see the angels, no good tidings will there be that day for the criminals. And the angels will say, prevented and inaccessible. Meaning, yes, one day they will see the angels, but that day is not going to be a day of good news. It's not going to be said that, oh, finally you see the angels. Rather, the angels will bring upon them punishment and wrath of Allah. And so they will be told, prevented and inaccessible. Meaning you can no longer do what you have been doing now. Your time is up. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favor and His mercy are now prohibited upon you. And your end denial and arrogance, then when they will see the angels, the angels will not bring them good news. They will bring them punishment. And so they will be hijram mahjura, meaning that now they will be caught. They will have lost all their freedom and they will be unable to escape. وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْسُورًا And we will regard what they have done of deeds and we will make them as dust dispersed. Meaning whatever great things that they accomplished in the world, whatever progress they made, However advanced they became, all of their achievements, all of their accomplishments will be blown away, turned into dust. Meaning none of that is going to benefit them on the day of judgment. The thing is that this world and everything in it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including us and whatever there is at our disposal. So if a person works in this life without iman, without following the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approves of, then such work will be worthless on the day of judgment. Think about it. If you study the wrong book for an exam, if you do not follow the rules of the game, then you're dismissed. Your efforts will not bring any benefit. So Abdullah ibn Mubarak said that these are deeds which are done for other than Allah. Meaning such deeds will be blown away. They will be turned into dust that is dispersed. Mujahid said that these are deeds that will not be honored by acceptance. Meaning these are actions which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept. And these are not just people who live in disbelief and who associate partners with Allah. The Prophet ﷺ warned us. He said, I know of a people from my ummah who will come on the day of judgment with good deeds like that of the mountain of Tihama, meaning huge, massive collections of good deeds. But Allah will turn them into scattered dust. He said, beware, they are your brothers of your skin, meaning they're human like you. They look like you. They take a portion of the night for worship as you do. But they are people who, when they are alone, they indulge in the forbidden things. Meaning they commit forbidden deeds in privacy. In privacy, they are worse than they are in front of you. Meaning they only fear you. They don't actually fear Allah. When they do something good, it is just to impress people. It is not to seek the approval of Allah. And this is why there is such Two-facedness, that in front of people, so pious and righteous, but in privacy, so horrible. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So such deeds will be blown away on the day of judgment. They will be rendered worthless. It is said, the companions of paradise that day are in a better settlement and better resting place. وَأَحْسَنُ maqila. And you see, maqila is the place or time of qaylula. And qaylula is to take a nap, meaning during the day. So we see that the people in paradise will take qaylula. Why? Why will they take a nap? Because why not? Why do you take a nap on Eid day? It's not because you are very sleepy or you're very tired, but this is just something that we enjoy doing when we are relaxed. So just like that, people in paradise will take a nap. And it is actually a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to take a short nap in the afternoon. Anas radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet ﷺ, when he would visit his house, meaning the house of Anas, then Umm Sulaim radiallahu anhu used to spread a leather mat for him, and he used to take a midday nap on that mat. Meaning, even if he was not at home, he was somewhere else. If it was time for a nap, he would take a nap. But remember that a nap, a qaylula, is actually a very short nap. It is not that a person is now sleeping during the day for hours and hours. So we see that Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, when he saw that the shadows shifted from west to east, meaning that people were now reaching the end of the day, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he would say to the people who were still taking a nap, that get up. Any time spent after this is for shaitan. So any person that he passed by who was still sleeping, he would wake them up. So it is good to take a nap in the afternoon, but remember that this nap should not be very, very long because then it makes a person groggy and, you know, it can also cause headaches even when a person is fasting. Ishaq ibn Abdullah said that taking qaylula is from the deeds of the people of goodness, of ahlul khair. And it strengthens the heart because you see when you're well rested, even if you've taken a short nap, and it allows you to feel at ease. So it strengthens the heart. You're mentally, you know, more fresh and it gives power to pray in the night. Meaning you also find the physical strength to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is very important that especially in the month of Ramadan, we take a short nap in the afternoon. Not a very long one, but a short one, inshallah. And mention the day when the heaven will split open with emerging clouds and the angels will be sent down in successive descent. Meaning the sky will open up and then the angels will come forth surrounding from all around. So where will people escape to? Al-mulku yawma idhin al-haqqu rahman True sovereignty. That day is for al-Rahman, the most merciful. Subhanallah. Only His judgment will prevail. The day of judgment is certainly very frightening. But the fact that the name al-Rahman is mentioned in this context brings so much comfort and hope. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned His ultimate sovereignty and power over here with His name Ar-Rahman, the extremely merciful, meaning whose mercy encompasses everything. And the 99 parts of His mercy are reserved for that day. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more merciful to His servants than they are to themselves. So to be worthy of His mercy on the day of judgment, we have to do what pleases him right now. وَكَانَ يَوْمًا عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ عَسِيرًا And it will be upon the disbelievers a difficult day. Meaning Allah is extremely merciful. But remember that those who deny, then His His mercy is for all. But in the hereafter, it is only for those who are worthy of it. And the day the wrongdoer will bite on his hands. Why? out of regret, out of anger. And we see that even in this life, when a person is extremely angry and regretful, they resort to self-harm. So on the day of judgment, a person will bite at his own hands. What is the regret over? He will say, oh, I wish I had taken with the messenger away. I wish I had accompanied the messenger. I had been on the path of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh, woe to me. I wish I had not taken that one as a friend. He led me away from the remembrance after it had come to me. So choose your friends carefully. Because we see that this person will have many regrets on the Day of Judgment. The first regret will be 
for not following the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That he will wish that he had followed the messenger, that he had obeyed the messenger, that he had not left his way. And remember, this is not just people who don't believe in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We learned that on the day of judgment, some people will be prevented from reaching the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at the Hawd Kawthar. And when he will try to intercede for them, it will be said that you don't know what they changed in the religion after you. Meaning, they learned about your way, but then they modified it. They changed the religion. They added things to it as if they knew better than the Prophet wasallam. So such people will be in immense regret on the Day of Judgment. So we really need to see that how closely are we following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is it that we are doing things as we please? Or are we doing things the way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught? And never even think of overstepping his way. Because we are told in the Qur'an, لا تقدموا Don't even try to get ahead of Allah and His Messenger. Meaning stay behind. Stay behind the Messenger. Let Him be your leader. Meaning when He is your leader, that means you follow Him. You don't come up with your own ways. You have to follow Him. So people who get distracted from His way, sometimes even in the name of piety, then this will be a source of great regret on the Day of Judgment. So it is important that we learn about the Prophet ﷺ, not just his life story. Because when we think about the Messenger ﷺ, generally we only think about his seerah, which battles he participated in, or the companions' names, etc. Yes, that is important, but we also have to study his teachings, his habits, his manners, his etiquette, the way that he worshipped Allah, the way that he lived the Qur'an. And for that, it is necessary that we also study the hadith. Because remember, the hadith, it is the words which preserves the life of the Prophet ﷺ. His actions, his behavior, his interactions with people. So in order to follow him, first we must learn. And then secondly, we see in these verses that this person will regret over having friends that led him away from the dhikr. Meaning that led him away from the Qur'an. The thing is that as human beings, we all need friends. We need that sense of belonging. We want those people to have conversations with, to have fun with. But sometimes a person can also get trapped within their social circle where their friends, the people that are around them are not really, you know, conducive to them achieving their goals. Rather, their social circle is becoming any, an obstacle for them. That they're not allowing this person to follow the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to follow the Quran, to remember it. Now think about it. If, for example, at work there are certain people who you know affect your productivity, meaning they constantly keep talking to you, they keep distracting you, and then you see that that is affecting your work, which could put your you know job at risk, then you do have to you know put some hard boundaries. If your child, for example, is getting distracted from his studies because of a certain friend, again, you will do something about that. But it's unfortunate that we have all the rules for our children, but no rules for ourselves. So if someone is affecting your afterlife, if someone is preventing you from the Qur'an, and this is not always directly but indirectly also. If someone is taking you away from the Qur'an, from reciting it, from following it, then there's a big problem here. The Prophet ﷺ warned us that a person is on the religion of his friend. So each person should see who is it that he has befriended. Because remember, you are an average of the five people that you surround yourself with the most. So who is it that you surround yourself with? Each person needs to see that the people that I hang out with are they such that they help me with the purpose of my life, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or are they becoming a hurdle? And ever is shaitan to man a deserter. And friends who are like shaitan are the same. They lie, they betray, they use, and then they leave. They abandon at the end. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولِ And then to add to all of this, the messenger will say. The messenger will complain. The messenger will testify. What? That, Ya Rabbi, O oh my Lord, indeed my people have taken this Qur'an as a thing abandoned. Meaning they have abandoned the Qur'an. And Mahjura is not just something that is abandoned, but it is also an object of mockery.
Meaning, the Prophet will testify against the people who have abandoned the Qur'an. And this will be on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet ﷺ will say, Can you imagine? Leaving the Qur'an, abandoning the Qur'an is no small thing. In a hadith, we learn that whoever places the Qur'an behind his back, then it will drive him to hellfire. It will push him towards hellfire. And imagine on the Day of Judgment, even the Messenger will testify against such a person. Even the Messenger will testify against such a person. The question is, how does a person leave the Qur'an? How is it that a person makes a mockery of the Qur'an? How is it that he abandons it? Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah writes that Hajr al-Qur'an, abandoning the Qur'an is in a number of ways. One is that a person does not listen to it, that they don't even pay attention to its words. They don't believe in it. Then it is to not live by it, meaning to not regard its lawful as lawful, its unlawful as unlawful. Because there are people who believe in the Qur'an, who do listen to it, but they only believe in it and listen to it for the purpose of worship, for the purpose of just earning some good deeds, not to follow. This is also a form of abandoning the Qur'an. Then abandoning the Qur'an is also to not pay regard to its law, to its rulings, believing that it is not necessary to follow the law of the Qur'an, that now it is irrelevant. And then it is to not reflect upon it. This is also a form of abandoning the Qur'an, to not bother to understand its meanings or to learn them. And finally, abandoning the Qur'an is also by not seeking shifa through it. Meaning, when a person falls ill, whether it is a spiritual illness, a moral illness, you know, mental illness or physical illness, if a person only seeks treatment through other things and they don't seek treatment through the Qur'an because they think, oh, the Qur'an does not heal, then this is also a form of abandoning the Qur'an. The Qur'an is a healing and we must believe in that. We must accept that. And remember that when we tell people, for example, the importance and necessity of, you know, seeking therapy, for instance, then please, please do not diminish the importance of the Quran. You know, people will say things like, and unfortunately, I have heard this from many professionals, people will say things like, if you have a broken bone, you will not tell a person to recite the Quran, you will tell them to go to the doctor. So just like that, if a person has a mental illness, don't tell them to recite the Qur'an. Tell them to go to the therapist. Tell them to go to the professional. This is a very unfair and wrong and disrespectful comparison. When we are suffering, whether it is from a spiritual illness or a physical illness, our first step should be to seek healing through the Qur'an. Because Allah tells us that the Qur'an is shifa. And to diminish and disregard the value of the Qur'an Yani, this is extremely disrespectful. The Qur'an is not just empty words. The Qur'an is divine words. It is blessed words. It is mubarak. Did the Prophet ﷺ not tell people to seek healing through the Qur'an? Did he not say, Ali jiha bi kitab If the Qur'an heals physical ailments, then what do you think about spiritual or emotional wounds? The Qur'an certainly heals. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the companions were traveling and they came across the people. Their leader was bitten by a venomous creature. And one of the companions just recited Surah Al-Fatiha and the man was healed. And the Prophet ﷺ approved of this. Yani, if the Qur'an heals the physical body, what do you think? Will it not heal what is in the mind? Absolutely, it will heal. So never ever diminish the power of the Qur'an by saying that, oh, don't recite the Qur'an. Only go to the therapist. No, you go to the therapist. Absolutely you do. You go to the doctor. Absolutely you do. You take the medication. Absolutely you do. However, part of your treatment plan must be the book of Allah. And if we think that the book of Allah does not heal, then this is a way of abandoning the Quran. We have so much faith in the DSM-5, but we don't have faith in the book of Allah. Any, all of these sciences are new. You know, there's still research being done and we accept that and we try and we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the things that we are learning, the different techniques that we can apply. But we must not dismiss the value of the Quran because remember, the Quran is the words of Allah. It is kalamullah. So understand what this is. 
And we don't want to be of those people against whom Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam complains on the day of judgment that my people abandoned the Quran. They had more faith and trust in other things than the Quran. So encourage people, make them understand the importance of therapy and medication, but don't do that by bringing the Quran down. That is unfair and that is zulm. Imam Shanqiti, he writes that every Muslim who is afraid of standing before his Lord should reflect over this verse. He should reflect deeply in order to save himself from this great calamity and make a way out of this extreme difficulty that has actually affected all Muslims in the world. And what is this great difficulty? What is this extreme calamity? It is the abandoning of the Quran that almost all Muslims are suffering from. So we all need to take a look at this ayah personally, that how much is the Quran really in my life? And remember that the healing from the Quran, it comes from its words, meaning it's mere recitation. The healing from the Quran, it comes from, you know, listening to it. But the healing also comes from understanding the Quran, reflecting upon it. Because a lot of times, you know, the problems that we are experiencing, they are to do with the way we think. So the Quran helps us think correctly. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًّا مِنَ الْمُجْرِمِينَ And thus have we made for every prophet an enemy from among the criminals who oppose the prophet. But sufficient is your Lord as a guide and a helper. And those who disbelieve say, why was the Quran not revealed to him all at once? Thus it is that we may strengthen thereby your heart. See this? The Quran was not all given at once because the Quran is meant to strengthen the heart. What does that mean? That the Quran brings strength to the heart. And we have spaced it distinctly. Meaning this is on purpose. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted, all of the Quran could have been given to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in one day. But that was not the case. It was revealed over the course of his life, over 23 years. Why? So that it would bring him healing and strength. And don't we see this in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa How he was at the beginning of the prophethood? How upset he used to be, how sad he used to be, how worried he used to be. So much that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that perhaps you would kill yourself. Yani, he would almost die from the stress and the anxiety and the fear. And what brought him strength? It was the Quran. It was a constant connection with the Quran. So really, we are doing ourselves a disservice We are really being unfair to ourselves if we seek treatment through this and through that, you know, through trial and error, and we fail to benefit from what is guaranteed, and that is the Quran. And they do not come to you with an argument, except that we bring you the truth and the best explanation in response to it. And this is one of the wisdoms behind why the Quran was revealed gradually. Because every time the people came up with a question, then revelation would be sent accordingly. Every time that the Prophet ﷺ was in some difficulty, the guidance of the Qur'an was given to him to help him solve the problem. And the same is for us. The Qur'an is relevant till today. Wallahi, it is relevant to you if you take it as a source of guidance. And when you will open it, you will feel as though the Qur'an is speaking to you. It's amazing. One day you're sad, you open the Quran and the Quran brings you relief. One day you are wondering about how to deal with your children, the way that they're behaving, and you learn such a beautiful solution from the Quran. No matter what problem you're going through in your life, you stay connected with the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you. The ones who are gathered on their faces to hell, those are the worst in position and farthest astray in their way. And we had certainly given Musa the scripture and appointed with him his brother Harun as an assistant. And we said, go both of you to the people who have denied our signs. Then we destroyed them with complete destruction. And the people of Nuh, meaning the same thing happened with them. When they denied the messengers, we drowned them and we made them for mankind a sign. And we have prepared for the wrongdoers a painful punishment. And we destroyed Ad and Samud and the companions of the well and many generations between them. And for each, we presented examples and each we destroyed with total destruction. And they, meaning the people of Makkah, have already come upon the town, meaning of the people of Luke, which was showered with the rain of 
evil. So have they not seen it? But they are not expecting resurrection. Meaning even when they come across the ruins of the people of the past, they don't learn a lesson. And when they see you, they take you not except in ridicule. Subhanallah, the Prophet ﷺ was such a noble, respectable man. He was known as someone honest and trustworthy. And then when he started calling people to the worship of Allah, all of a sudden people started calling him crazy. They would make fun of him. And this happens today as well, that there are individuals who are very respectable. People are absolutely cool and perfect with them until they mention the Quran. Then they say, oh, he's a little weirdo saying, is this the one whom Allah has sent a messenger? He almost would have misled us from our gods had we not been steadfast in worship of them. But they are going to know when they see the punishment who is farthest astray in his way. Have you seen the one who takes as his God his own desire? Then would you be responsible for him? Have you seen the person who worships himself? Meaning he's very, very obedient to his desire. So he fulfills every wish. He is so obedient to his desire that it is as if his desire is his God. He obeys his wishes as a God is obeyed. And remember, the urges of the nafs, they only mislead a person. Because in the nafs amaratum bisu, the nafs only urges a person to do what is evil. And it leads him on in corruption. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَتَّبِعِ الْهَوَى فَيُضِلَّكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Do not follow the desire because it will mislead you from the path of Allah. So remember, following every wish and every desire is not self-care. This is narcissism. It is selfishness. It is worshipping the desire. It is about being blind to the needs of others, being blind to one's obligations towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is putting one's desire over the commands of Allah. And this is what is being condemned over here, that a person does whatever they feel like. They leave whatever they feel like. They just do what they please. And the Prophet wasallam said that under the sky of all the gods that are worshipped besides Allah, the worst in the sight of Allah is the desire that is obeyed. So remember, the Muslim, the one who has surrendered to Allah, is not the one who has surrendered to his desire. No, he has surrendered to Allah. This is why the Muslim will do things which the nafs does not like, the desire does not like, which in fact is contrary to the desire. The Prophet ﷺ warned us that hellfire is surrounded by all kinds of desires and passions, while paradise is surrounded by all kinds of disliked and undesirable things. And the Prophet ﷺ also said, that how many a people are those who pursue their desires, meaning they are engrossed in fulfilling their desires and they will have on the day of judgment, nothing but hell, nothing but hell, which means that if we want to go to Jannah, then we have to bring ourselves to do things that we don't always like. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes them, then we have to do those things. Or do you think that most of them hear or reason? They are not except like livestock. Rather, they are even more astray in their way. Have you not considered your Lord, how he extends the shadow? And if he willed, he could have made it stationary. Then we made the sun for it an indication. Yani, the sun could have just been still, you know, fixed in one place. But the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the system, it is such that we see the sun moving. Yes, we know that the earth is moving. Okay, but Yani, from our perspective, it's as though the sun is moving. And because of that, Yani, the shadows on earth also shift. The light also dims. You know, it increases, it decreases. And how beautiful is that? Then we hold it in hand for a brief grasp meaning for the duration of the night. And it is he who has made the night for you as clothing and sleep a means for rest and has made the day 
a resurrection. And it is he who sends the winds as good tidings before his mercy. And we send down from the sky pure water that we may bring to life thereby a dead land and give it as drink to those we created of numerous livestock and men. And we have certainly distributed it among them that they might be reminded, but most of the people refuse except disbelief. And if we had willed, we could have sent into every city a warner. So do not obey the disbelievers. And strive against them with it. A great striving. With what? With the Quran. Because at this time, remember this is a Makki surah. At this time, the Prophet ﷺ had the Quran in his heart. Not a weapon. So strive against them with this Quran. Meaning, the striving of yours should be kabir. It should be great. It should be a great struggle. Meaning, the more people reject it, the stronger you should be in believing in the Quran and in conveying the message of the Quran. Don't succumb before their threats and don't become afraid. No, strive with your utmost and convey it to people, as many people as you can. Don't just struggle to make the Quran a part of your life, but strive to take it to others as well because people deserve to know. And we see that the Prophet ﷺ did strive a great deal. He he would go to the markets. He would walk through the tents in Mina. He would go to individuals. He would go to crowds. He would go and recite the Quran. And he would teach it to individuals. He even sent letters. He spared no effort whatsoever. And it is he who has released simultaneously the two seas. Meaning all types of water, all bodies of water are not the same. One fresh and sweet and one salty and bitter. And he has placed between them a barrier and prohibiting partition. Meaning when these large bodies of water meet, they don't mix immediately. They don't blend instantly. They remain true to who they are for a very long time. So it is important for us to embrace this diversity within the creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. Because there is benefit in that. Salt water serves a purpose and fresh water also serves a purpose. And it is he who has created from water a human being and made him a relative by lineage and marriage. And ever is your Lord competent, meaning with regards to his creation. But they worship rather than Allah, that which does not benefit them or harm them. And the disbeliever is ever against his Lord and assistant, meaning to shaitan. So we should support each other in good things. Not that we start listening to shaitan and become an assistant to him. And we have not sent to you, O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, except as a bringer of good tidings and a warner. Say, I do not ask of you for it any payment, only that whoever wills might take to his Lord a way. That is all I ask of you. And rely upon the ever living who does not die. Put your faith in Allah. Allah does not die. And exalt Allah with his praise. Whenever you worry, whenever you get sad, then sabbih bihamdi. And sufficient is he to be with the sins of his servants acquainted. Allah knows what people are doing. He who created the heavens and the earth and what is between them in six days and then established himself above the throne. The most merciful. He is ar-Rahman. Fas'al bihi khabira. So ask about him, one well-informed. Meaning when you want to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't go on asking people who don't know Allah. Ask those who know Allah, who are well-informed. And who is that? That is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So remember, if we want to know about Allah, we have to see what is mentioned in the Quran about Allah Azza wa Jal and how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described his Lord Azza wa Jal. We don't come up with our own descriptions. And when it is said to them, prostrate to the most merciful, usjudu rahman they say, Wamar Rahman, and what is the most merciful? They don't recognize him. They say, Should we prostrate to that which you order us? And it increases them in aversion, meaning they get offended when the name of Allah Ar Rahman is mentioned. So the fact is that many people don't understand who Ar Rahman is. Remember, Ar Rahman is also one of the major names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, it is the 
the second most important name of Allah. The primary name is Allah. And then it is Ar-Rahman. In many places, the name Ar-Rahman comes immediately after Allah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, who is He? He is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. So this shows us that when we think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should not just think that He is God. Absolutely He is God. He is the one who we worship. But the first thought that should come to our mind about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He is extremely merciful. He is extremely compassionate. And this is what we need to teach our children also. You see, typically, little children, we threaten them, we frighten them that Allah will punish you. Allah will throw you in hell. Allah will, you know, do this and do that to you. And so children, they grow up with more fear of God than love for God. So we have to keep that balance. But of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, remember, it is greater than his wrath. It overcomes his wrath. So make sure you emphasize on rahmah more than ghadab. Tell people about the ghadab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, but tell them about his rahmah even more so that they have more hope. Tabarakalladhi, blessed is he who has placed in the sky great stars and placed therein a burning lamp, meaning the sun and luminous moon. And it is he who has made the night and the day in succession, meaning one goes so that the other can come for whoever desires to remember or desires gratitude, meaning the cyclical rotation of the night and day. The stark differences between the night and the day, they remind us of very important things. And they also teach us, they also bring about feelings of gratitude in us. And just like that, when things change in our lives, you know, good times, they leave and some trial comes and then trial goes and then, you know, we experience a blessing. This constant shift you know, this cyclical rotation of night and day, of good times, you know, of ease and hardship. What is this? It brings about reminder. It teaches us very important lessons. And it also brings about shukr, feelings of gratitude. So there's a purpose behind all of this. And we see that specifically because of the night and day. You see, this creates the circadian rhythm within us, which not only allows us to rest and recuperate, but also allows us to make sense of time. You know, we have this natural biological clock. And because of that, you know, the change in time, it helps us remember what we may have forgotten. And also we see that when, you know, we're getting so tired because of the fact that we've been working all day. And then when we fall asleep, you know, as we're getting into our beds, it's really, you feel that gratitude that Alhamdulillah, that Allah has, you know, brought the night so that we can rest. That Alhamdulillah, Allah has given us the chance to freshen up again. So this is a blessing. And this is something that should teach us lessons. And it also bring about feelings of gratitude. And also, you know, the fact that things change, the time changes, it allows us to remember things that we have forgotten. Because if things always remain the same, then we lose track of time. We don't have that sense of time. And these days, subhanAllah, because we're indoors constantly, we forget even which date it is. SubhanAllah. So when we are connected with the nature, you know, we see the night, the day, we see the changing of the moon. We have the sense of time and that allows us to remember things that we have forgotten. In a hadith, we learned that he who forgets the prayer should say it when he remembers it. And that is the kafara for it. Meaning when you remember, then you perform the prayer. Where ibad rahman and the servants of the most merciful, ibad the slaves of the most merciful, the true worshipers of Ar-Rahman, meaning those worshipers of Allah who truly deserve his special mercy, his extreme mercy. Who are they? What kind of actions do they do? Remember, all people are Allah's ibad. They are Allah's servants. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions someone as an abd, sometimes this is to really show that they are Excellent worshippers. For example, when the Prophet ﷺ is described in the Quran as Allah's Abd, that is to teach us, to remind us that the Prophet ﷺ is the best worshipper. So we should follow his example. So Ibad al-Rahman, the true worshippers of Ar-Rahman, who seek his special Rahmah, who will be worthy of his special Rahmah, what kind of Ibadah do they do? 
What is their worship like? First of all, there are those who walk upon the earth easily, not lazily as if they have no life, but with humility, not arrogance, but gently, not roughly, firmly, with dignity, without, you know, creating noise or panic or causing harm to others. And Yamshuna, yes, it is walking, but driving is also similar. So Yamshuna al ardi haunan, because the Ibadur Rahman are calm in their minds. They're mindful, they're focused. They're focused on Allah's Rahmah. You know, they have that hope inside of them. They expect Allah's Rahmah. So their walk, their behavior, their manner also reflects that. That's why they don't panic because they know Rahman is there. He will take care of their situation. And when the ignorant address them harshly, they say words of peace, meaning they respond to ignorance with peaceful words, not ill speech or indecent words. So they're not rude or ill-tempered in response to ignorant behavior. Remember, ignorance, jahl, is of two kinds. One is that literally someone does not know. So when they don't know, such as children, and children sometimes in their jahala, in their ignorance, they behave in a very foolish way. They say things that are completely illogical. So when someone doesn't know any better, then why get frustrated and rude with them? Because it's not going to help the situation anyway. The second type of jahl is that a person knows, but they're behaving ignorantly. Why are they behaving ignorantly? Because of being overcome by emotion, such as their anger or their jealousy. So because they're not in the right state of mind, then saying peaceful words will actually solve the problem. And responding to fire with fire will only aggravate the situation. This is why, وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا They say words of peace. And this is something that we need to practice, especially these days when we are at home. Because people, you know, either we are dealing with our children more than ever, who really are in many ways jahil, yani they don't understand, they don't know. So there's no need to respond to their ignorant you know, demands with harshness and you know, with rudeness and with anger because that's not going to solve any problem. And if people ever get overcome by their anger or their jealousy or their panic or their worry because everybody is stressing out about their work, then again, don't add fire to fire but rather say peaceful words to help calm the situation down. But remember, this does not justify the wrong of the ignorant. No, it doesn't justify that. But when someone is behaving ignorantly with you, then you save yourself and do not stoop to their level. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ deal with people in that way? Absolutely he did. When there was a man who came and urinated in the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ said peaceful words. When the man came and pulled on you know, the shawl of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ did not aggravate the situation by becoming angry over there. So always focus on the solution, not the problem. And those who spend part of the night to their Lord prostrating and standing in prayer, meaning they spend the night Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, qiyam is to worship in the night, any part of the night. And it could be any worship, but especially salah. Because you see, sujjadan wa qiyam is mentioned, sajda prostration, and standing in prayer is mentioned. Which means that when we're praying in the night, these two parts of the prayer, the qiyam and the sajda, especially deserve our attention. Meaning that our recitation should be long. And our sajda should also be long. Sometimes what happens is that we focus on the recitation so much that, for example, we are just aiming to complete, you know, the entire juz in the salah. So our sajda becomes very, very short, that we're barely able to say subhanahu rabbi al-a'la, you know, three times, very quickly. So sujadan, notice how sajda is mentioned first. Prostration is mentioned first because in sajda is when you connect with Allah, you make dua, you ask. In qiyam, you recite the Quran and in sajda, you beg Allah. So remember praying in the night. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising over here. And this is the way of the righteous, the quality of the people of paradise. In fact, it is a prophetic way. And it is the best prayer after obligatory prayers. And it is a means of drawing close to Allah. It is a means of earning forgiveness. It is a way of showing gratitude. And the believer's honor is in praying Qiyamul Layl. And remember that even if a person is able to recite a little bit of the Quran in the night, 
then it is worth it. We learn in the hadith that if a person recites 10 verses in the night, then a qintar of reward is written for him. And a qintar of reward is better than the world and whatever that is in it. So yes, there are some nights when we're really tired. Perhaps it is on the day when you missed your suhoor and you had a lot of work to do during the day. So by the time Risha hits, you are exhausted and you just want to sleep. Just push yourself a little bit more. Pray two rakah, pray four rakah, and just recite 10 verses. And what does that mean? Just recite, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقُ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Even if you recite that a few times, yani you have recited more than 10 verses. And for that, the reward is a qintar, a heap of reward, better than the world and whatever that is in it. And if a person recites 100 verses in the night, then the reward of the entire night's worship is written for them. So make use of these nights. Because remember, the qiyam in the nights of Ramadan is even better. It brings forgiveness of sins. And when a man asked the Prophet wasallam that if I were to do qiyam in the nights of Ramadan, then who would I be amongst? And he said, Anta mina siddiqina wa shuhada. You would be among the truthful and the martyrs, meaning amongst the best of Allah's servants on the day of judgment. So every single night matters. And those who say, our Lord, avert from us the punishment of hell. Indeed, its punishment is ever adhering. Indeed, it is evil as a settlement and residence. So we should also make dua to Allah. That, ya Allah, ajirni min an Oh Allah, save me from the punishment of hell. The Prophet wasallam told us, seek Allah's protection from the punishment of hell. And when you seek refuge from hell, you need three times. Even hellfire says, Allahumma ajirhu minni. Oh Allah, save him from me. Allahumma ajirni min nar Allahumma ajirni min nar Allahumma ajirni min nar And there are those who, when they spend, do so not excessively or sparingly, but are ever between that justly moderate. Meaning they're neither cheap nor are they wasteful. And those who do not invoke with Allah another deity or kill the soul which Allah has forbidden to be killed except by right and do not commit unlawful sexual intercourse. And whoever should do that, meaning any of these sins, will meet a penalty. There are consequences for this. Multiplied for him is the punishment on the day of resurrection, meaning that punishment will be ever increasing and growing one after the other, and he will abide therein, humiliated, unable to come out, except for those who repent, believe, and do righteous deeds. For them, Allah will replace their evil deeds with good. And ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. And he who repents and does righteousness does indeed turn to Allah with accepted repentance. Subhanallah. You see, sincere repentance. We see the benefit of that in these verses. That it converts sins into good deeds. Meaning now a person is rewarded as if they had performed good deeds of similar amount. So sincere repentance, what is that? It is when a person, when they think of their sins, they don't say, oh, I missed that. Oh, that was fun. No, they say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Ya Allah, erase that sin from me. They seek forgiveness. They cry. And they don't just stop there. They get busy in doing good things that I need to make up for all of that. So when they do good, then inna al-hasanat yudhibna sayyi'at. Good deeds erase bad deeds. And every time that a person repents, they seek forgiveness, they do something good. Then we learn in hadith that, you know, sins are like chain mail that is around a person. So every time that a person does something good, then a link from that chain mail is broken. So when a person increases in their istighfar, in their good deeds, then that chain mail completely breaks down until that person is completely free. This is why we are taught that if you commit a sin, then replace it with a good one. A private one in private and a public one in public. Meaning depending on the nature of the sin, if you did it privately, then replace it with a private good deed. If you committed a sin openly, then commit a good deed openly. Meaning that is the kafara for it. That is the expiation for it. We learned that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked, Ya Rasulullah, what do you think of a man who did every single sin? Meaning every sin in the book, he's done it. He did not leave any sin whatsoever. 
did not leave any desire, big or small, except that he fulfilled it. Is there any tawbah for him? The Prophet ﷺ said, did you accept Islam? He said, yes, I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad ﷺ is the messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, do good deeds and leave sins and Allah will turn all your sins into good deeds. Allahu Akbar. And we learned that on the day of judgment, a person will be brought and it will be said, present all of his minor sins and all of his minor sins will be presented. And it will be said, did you do this? And did you do this? And did you do this? And the person will admit, yes, I did this. I did this. I did this. And he will be so afraid that these are just my minor sins. What about my major sins? And it will be said that give him in place of every sin, a good deed. So when he will see all of his sins, his minor sins being converted into good deeds, he will say, Ya Allah, I know that I have committed some major sins, but I don't see them over here. Subhanallah. Why? Because Allah will convert the sins into good deeds, meaning now a person will be rewarded. This is the benefit of tawbah. So repent. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Seek forgiveness. Make tawbah every day, multiple times a day. And never ever think about yourself that, oh, what sin did I ever commit? La tuzakku anfusakum. Don't claim yourselves to be pure. Allah knows who you are. And there are those who do not testify to falsehood, meaning they do not give false testimony. And they don't observe, they don't look at what is untrue. Falsehood does not attract them, even if it's for the purpose of entertainment. And when they pass near ill speech, Allahu, well, how do they pass? They pass by with dignity, meaning they don't participate in it. They avoid it in a dignified way without getting affected by it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising such people and those who, when they are reminded of the verses of their Lord, do not fall upon them deaf and blind. No, they listen attentively. They try their best to understand the verses of Allah and they follow them to the best of their ability. And those who say, our Lord, grant us from among our spouses and offspring comfort to our eyes and make us an example for the righteous. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyati so they pray not just for themselves but their loved ones also that ya allah make them a source of qurrat ayun for us a coolness for our eyes and what does that mean that when we see them when we see their actions when we see the good deeds that they're doing we are delighted because remember when you see your family doing good things Ibadah, when you see them worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, in the hereafter, you see the reward that they are given for that. This is what will bring you true joy and absolute pleasure. And this is real pride, you know, real happiness. You know, yes, we are happy when we see our families achieving their worldly goals. We are very happy when we see our children accomplishing something, you know, get a certain medal or win a certain contest. And that is excellent. But our main concern should be that, Ya Allah, make them obedient, righteous servants to you so that they don't just bring us comfort here but they bring us true happiness and delight in the hereafter. وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama, And make us a leader, an example of those who are righteous. Meaning, make them righteous. Make our children, our families righteous. Why? Because if they're righteous, then they will also help us be righteous. Because you see, children who are God-fearing, they also remind their parents, the dad, this is not allowed. Mom, this is not okay. Al-Qurali said that there is nothing more pleasing to the believer than seeing his wife and his children obedient to Allah the Exalted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that save yourselves and your families from the fire. This is why we must focus on our families as well and teach them and make dua for them especially. You see, Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha, she took her son Anas to the service of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She wasn't just concerned about, you know, the good health of her son, but she wanted him to have the best company. So we should be concerned about the religious upbringing, the religious welfare of our loved ones also. And remember, I mean, azwajina, azwaj, yes, it includes husband and wife, and it also includes those who are like you, meaning your companions. 
So make dua, not just for yourself or your children or your spouse, your family, your loved ones, but also your companions. That, yeah, Allah, people that I work with, make them righteous. Make them a source of comfort for us. Not that we're always, you know, caught up in arguments and fights and demanding, you know, things from one another. Grant us sukoon in our families. Fill our, you know, home with your worship so that we enjoy true pleasure forever and for always and make us righteous servants to you. Those will be awarded the chamber, al-ghurfata, meaning in paradise, for what they patiently endured. You see, sabr, ibadah requires sabr, and they will be received therein with greetings and words of peace. Abiding eternally therein, good is the settlement and residence. So over here, many characteristics of Ibadur Rahman are mentioned. And these are characteristics that we should review on a regular basis so that we also practice them, inshallah. Say, what would my Lord care for you if not for your supplication? Allah is not in need of you. You are in need of Allah. So keep calling upon Allah. Keep asking Him. For you have denied. So your denial is going to be adherent. So the one who does not seek Allah then Allah also does not need him. Allah is actually angry with the person who does not call upon him. So let us keep calling upon him. Let us keep expressing our you know, dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let us keep begging him, Azza wa Jal. Inshallah, we'll conclude here. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, so let's inshallah look at an ayah together. about the seas in the, um, on the earth, subhanAllah. And it is he who has released simultaneously the two seas, one fresh and sweet, and one salty and bitter. And he placed between them a barrier and a prohibiting partition. Okay, so there are two seas that are being mentioned, right? And what has Allah subhanAllah placed between them? A barrier. And so what does it mean when there's a barrier? Are we able to cross the barrier or partition? No. Okay. And so we see that, um, subhanAllah, you can also just Google search these images of um, these that don't mix, right? And so this is one of the images, subhanAllah. Yes, where one side is sweet and the other side is salty, right? And they never mix together, subhanAllah. And so just look it up. And this is uh, amazing. It's in multiple parts of the world that this happens. It's not just one place, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it that they do not mix. When we put salt water and sugar water, if we pour them into a bowl, what happens? Even if we try really hard, right, on each side to keep it separate, yes, it will mix, subhanAllah. Yes, they mix. But... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is managing these amazing, amazing bodies of water and they do not mix. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so now when we look at sweet water, we find that it's extremely pleasant, right? It's delicious, right? Like the water that you drink from the tap, for in instance, right? Um, or a bottled water, it is sweet water, right? It's delicious, it's sweet. It, there's a lot of it, right? Yes, it has nutrition, right? And then when we compare it to salty water, if, if, has anyone ever tasted salty water? Maybe you gargled with it, or maybe you were at the ocean, you were trying to make wudu, yes, or swimming, right? So it's very salty. Is it something you want to just keep drinking? No. <laughs> It's extremely unpleasant, it's bitter, it's warm. Yeah, it's hard to swallow, subhanAllah. Right? 
But when we look at the fish, subhanAllah, they survive in both. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created ocean life in both types of water. Right? And so there are some that only survive in salty water. And then there are others who can only survive in the sweet water. But then there are some who survive in both. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all types of creation. And then we can compare this to types of people. Are all people sweet? No, right? SubhanAllah. And are all people salty or bitter? No, right? But SubhanAllah, there are benefits in both. There are benefits in both type of people. Now we can very easily, I'm sure, come up with a list of benefits from sweet people. When you meet someone sweet, what are some of the benefits you get from them? Yes, after this ayah, Allah SWT mentions the relationship of in-laws. Barakallah feek, mashallah. Yeah, they're kind, they're peaceful. They make us feel good, they're friendly, they're pleasant, they have good manners, good words. Yeah, they rub off, it can rub off on you, right? They're compassionate, they're pleasing, easy to get along with, positive vibes. They give salam, yeah, they're warm, pleasant company, smiling, they don't harm you, they're mindful. Allahumma barik, mashallah, may Allah smata, enable us to incorporate all of these qualities. I mean, right, they give you hugs, yes, mashallah. What about salty people? Right, the sweet are courteous as well. What about salty? They're bitter, they're mean, they're rude, they're angry, they're not easy to talk to, they don't really smile, you try to avoid them, right? They're arrogant, they remind us of our shortcomings, yes. They have ugly behavior, they're obstinate, yes, we want to be away from them, they're selfish, unhappy, arrogant, they're negative, disrespectful, right? We do our best to stay away. So we've just made a list of terrible, terrible traits. Write them down, right? Write all of these traits down that you and your classmates have written and make sure that we only have the traits of the sweet. Because the reality is that we have both, right? Can anyone claim that I'm, I'm the sweetest person, honestly? No, right? It shows us different families have different qualities. Might think is bitter, but some might flourish in that environment. We should not judge. And yeah, exactly, Barakallah fikum. That's exactly the point of this exercise, right? Now, um, everyone that you have met that is sweet, are they always of benefit to you? Not necessarily, right? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, not really. Right? Sometimes they're just fun to be around, but they don't bring you any real benefit. And then there are people who are not the easiest people to deal with. But have you ever met someone who wasn't the easiest person, but still you found some benefit from them? And that's why you still, you know, hang out with them, get along with them, still kind of like keep their company. Yeah, sometimes I, indirectly. Yes. Exactly. So there are different types of people, right? Yeah, right. We need to strike a balance, exactly. Yes, in our own family as well, right? Somebody could have mood swings, subhanAllah, right? Yes, this is why we tolerate them, right? Yeah, sometimes people are hypocritical, right? Sweet by tongue, not by heart. Yes. But Allah subhanahu wa has benefit, put benefits in everyone. Right. So what are we going to do when we're dealing with others? Right. We're going to look at their good traits only. Because just because someone has a sharp tongue, it doesn't mean that they don't have other good qualities. Right. And just because somebody has a sweet tongue, it doesn't mean that they're of any real benefit to people. Right. And so, yeah, look at the glass half full. Yeah, that's true. 
look at the greener side always. So there are benefits in both types of people, right? So don't ever think that one is useless and one is useful, right? Allah subhanahu has put good qualities in every single person he has created. Now our job, now that we know there's sweet water and salty water, is to inshallah become sweet, right? Let's take that salty water out of us Right? and become good people. So whatever treat, uh, whatever trait we see in someone that we dislike, make a note of it. Because this is Allah subhanahu wa teaching us. It's a teaching moment, subhanAllah, to check ourselves. Right? Because sometimes when someone does something wrong, right, we are very uh, judgmental. But then when we do that exact same thing, we make an excuse for ourselves. Right? So make sure we're not making excuses for ourselves and it's kind of like continuing to you know, um, insist on that bad deed. Right? Alhamdulillah. So we're going to, inshallah, uh, make a note of all of the traits that everyone mentioned, inshallah, incorporate the good ones, and then, um, inshallah, stop yourself, right? Our job is to stop ourselves when we notice we're doing something wrong. Don't insist on it. Don't let shaitan come and convince us it's the right thing to do. It's never the right thing to do the wrong thing. Right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Accept the differences and deal with everyone gently. Okay, so let's continue. Is everyone ready for Jews 19 part two? All sweet students, yes. <laughs> okay, so let's begin uh, with Sister Thamia, Jiz 19, part two. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How are you all doing? Nahmadu. Mm -hmm. وبشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا زدنا علما سورة الشعراء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم طاسين ميم These are the verses of the clear book The Quran is a clear book meaning it is unapologetic in its truths. It is convincingly clear. It is manifest. It is unambiguous in its message. Perhaps, O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you would kill yourself with grief that they will not be believers. Look at his concern for humanity. If we willed, we could send down to them from the sky a sign for which their necks would remain humble. We can show them miracles that they would be unable to refuse. We can compel them to believe. But this is not the way of Allah. He does not force people. People have to embrace the truth themselves. And this is the test of life. And no revelation comes to them anew from the most merciful, except that they turn away from it. For they have already denied, but there will come to them the news of that which they used to ridicule. Did they not look at the earth? How much we have produced therein from every noble kind? What diversity Allah has created on the earth? And it's amazing how even through cracks, any plants are growing forth. Indeed, and that is a sign, but most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is the exalted in might, the merciful. وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ And mention when your Lord called Musa, saying, go to the wrongdoing people, those who are doing zulm on themselves by committing sin. Because remember, oppression is not just harming other people. When a person commits a sin, the first one they oppress is actually themselves. And that is what Fir'aun and his nation were doing. They were wronging themselves. And of course, they were also oppressing the Bani Israel. So he was told and mentioned when your Lord called Musa, saying, go to the wrongdoing people. The people of Fir'aun, will they not fear Allah? Musa salam said, my Lord, indeed, I fear that they will deny me. So the fear of denial, the fear of rejection is very normal. 
He said, and my chest will tighten. I feel extremely uncomfortable and my tongue will not be fluent. Meaning I'm afraid that out of my fear, I will not be able to express myself clearly. So send for Harun. Send him instead. Subhanallah. Musa alayhi salam was nervous. He was afraid. And this shows us that it is very, very normal to feel nervous around people. You know, sometimes we experience social anxiety, but sometimes we experience social anxiety in front of certain individuals. And that is fine. It happens. This is part of being human. But then how do you help yourself in a situation like that? Look at Musa alayhi salam. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَأَرُسِلْ إِلَى هَارُونَ Send Harun instead. And what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Harun alayhi salam as his assistant. So seek help through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look for people. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send you people who will be a source of support and comfort for you. And he said, and they have upon me a claim due to sin. Meaning I accidentally killed one of them. So I fear that they will kill me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no, go both of you with our signs. Indeed, we are with you listening. Inna ma'akum mustami'oon. So both of them were sent together. Why? Because at times, you know, certain responsibilities, certain burdens are too heavy to be carried by one individual alone. So it is very important that we share the burden. We share the responsibility with like-minded people, with people who are willing to support us. And when you don't find any supporters, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send you people who will aid you, who will support you, just like Musa alayhi salam did. فَأْتِيَا فِرْعَوْنَ Go to Fir'aun and say, We are the messengers of the Lord of the worlds. Commanded to say, Send with us the children of Israel. Fir'aun said, Did we not raise you among us as a child? And you remained among us for years of your life? Have you forgotten that? And then you did your deed which you did, and you were of the ungrateful. Do you remember what you did? You killed one of us and you just fled? Musa alayhi salam, he doesn't get defensive here. He doesn't get angry over here. He admits. He said, I did it. Then at that time, while I was of those astray, meaning it was a mistake, it was an accident. And then I fled from you when I feared because you were not just and fair. So I feared you. And that is why I fled. Then my Lord granted me wisdom and prophethood and appointed me as one of the messengers, meaning this is Allah's favor on me. Subhanallah, you see some people, they constantly remind you of the favors that they have done to you. And they constantly remind you of the mistakes that you made. Sometimes the mistakes that you made in your childhood. And they try to bring you down and they try to make you feel bad by reminding you of your mistakes. And this is you know, the worst thing that can be done. If someone has changed what they need is encouragement and support. Not that we keep bringing them down by shaming them, by reminding them of their past. So when you see positive change in people, please refrain from judging and criticizing them. Give them hope and encouragement. And here we see that Fir'aun only reminded Musa salam of the favors that Fir'aun had done to Musa salam, And he forgot about his own crimes. So Musa alayhi salam said, and is this a favor of which you remind me that you enslave the children of Israel? Meaning, why was I raised in your house anyway? Because you were killing my people. If you weren't killing my people, I would not have been in your house. So we see here that forgetting one's own crimes and remembering one's favors on others, yani this is a Fir'aunic act. This is from the behavior of Fir'aun. So in general also, we should refrain from reminding people of the favors that we have done them, even to our children. Why? Because this is a reprehensible thing. People don't like it and Allah does not like this. The Prophet ﷺ said that there are three people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not even speak to on the day of judgment. He will not even speak to them. And in another hadith, we learn that there are people whom Allah will neither accept their obligatory deeds nor voluntary deeds. Subhanallah. And who are these? Of them is al-manan, meaning the person who does a favor to others and then keeps reminding them for the rest of their life. Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember? You owe it to me. You owe it to me. And this is reprehensible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates this. Said Fir'aun, meaning now that he was speechless, he said, and what is the Lord of the worlds? Yani we see that constantly Fir'aun is avoiding the message 
that Musa alayhi salam is giving. And he's coming up with different ways to distract Musa alayhi salam and the people. Musa alayhi salam answered, he said, the Lord of the heavens and the earth and that between them, if you should be convinced. Fir'aun said to those around him, do you not hear? Musa said, your Lord and the Lord of your first forefathers. Fir'aun said, indeed, your messenger who has been sent to you is mad. Musa alayhi salam, again, he doesn't care about what Fir'aun is saying. He says, Lord of the East and the West and that between them, if you were to reason. So Musa alayhi salam does not take any of this personally. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't get distracted by what Fir'aun is trying to distract him with. He's focused on conveying his message. Fir'aun said, no, Fir'aun got annoyed. He said, if you take a God other than me, I will surely place you among those imprisoned. Musa alayhi salam said, even if I brought you proof manifest, Fir'aun said, then bring it, if you should be of the truthful. So Musa alayhi salam threw his staff, and suddenly it was a serpent manifest, and he drew out his hand. Thereupon it was white for the observers. Fir'aun said to the eminent ones around him, indeed, this is a learned magician. Subhanallah. He wants to drive you out of your land by his magic. So what do you advise? Musa alayhi salam never said, that I am here to expel you or to take over your civilization. All he said was, let the Bani Israel go, set them free. But yet, Fir'aun called the miracles magic, and he said that this man has some hidden agenda. They said, postpone the matter of him and his brother, and send among the cities gatherers who will bring you every learned, skilled magician. So the magicians were assembled for the appointment of a well-known day, and it was said to the people, will you congregate, that we might follow the magicians if they are the predominant? And when the magicians arrived, they said to Fir'aun, is there indeed for us a reward if we are the predominant? Subhanallah, first thing the magicians demanded, what's in it for us? He said, yes, and indeed, you will then be of those near to me. Musa alayhi salam said to them, throw whatever you will throw. So they threw their ropes and their staffs and said, by the might of Fir'aun, bi'izzati Fir'aun, indeed, it is we who are predominant. We shouldn't say such things, bi'izzati so and so. No, it should only be in fact, even when we are in pain, we are taught to say, Bismillah. And we should say the seven times. This is the best pain medication. Then Musa salam threw his staff, and at once it devoured what they falsified. So the magicians fell down in prostration to Allah because they knew, they understood. They said, we have believed in the Lord of the worlds, the Lord of Musa and Harun. Fir'aun got really upset. He said, you believed Musa before I gave you permission? Indeed, he is your leader who has taught you magic. Subhanallah. And his imagination is running wild. If he just accepted the truth as it was, he would be at so much peace. But you are going to know, I will surely cut off your hands and your feet on opposite sides, and I will surely crucify you all. The magician said, La bayir, no harm, whatever. Indeed, to our Lord, we will return. You see, the strength of Iman truly takes a person's fear away. Yes, a person feels afraid, but then because of Iman, their fear subsides. They're able to look at the big picture and they're able to rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said, indeed, we aspire that our Lord will forgive us our sins because we were the first of the believers. And we inspire to Musa, travel by night with my servants, make the hijrah, leave at night. Indeed, you will be pursued. Then Fir'aun sent among the cities gatherers and said, indeed, those are but a small band. And indeed, they are enraging us. This Bani Israel, they have fled. They're not that many, and they have made us very angry. And indeed, we are a cautious society. So you know what? We're going to preserve our civilization. We're going to go catch them, and we're going to bring them back. So we removed them from gardens and springs and treasures and honorable station. Thus, and we caused to inherit it the children of Israel. So they pursued them at sunrise. And when the two companies saw one another, because remember now the Bani Israel are right in front of the water. They don't know which way to go. And behind them now is who? Fir'aun and his great army. The companions of Musa a.s. said, Indeed, we are to be overtaken. Inna la mudrakun. That's it. We're doomed. Qala kalla. Musa a.s. said, No way. Inna ma'ya rabbi. Indeed, with me is my Lord. Sayahdeen. He will guide me. 
Musa alayhi salam is the prophet of Allah. And look at his level of faith and his hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That even though on one side is the water and on the other side is Fir'aun and his army, yani how do you escape? Do you go up? Do you fly somehow? Do you dig into the earth somehow and escape? Which way is the way out? You don't see any way out, but you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there and Allah will make a way. So remember, whoever fears Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala certainly creates a way out for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides them from where they cannot even expect, from where they cannot even imagine. So sometimes the taqwa of Allah means not losing hope. It means believing in the promise of Allah, having this yaqeen that my Lord will not abandon me. So Musa alayhi salam said, Inna ma'ya rabbi sayahdeen. And what happened then? فَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَى مُوسَىٰ أَنِضْرِبْ بِعَصَاكَ الْبَحْرِ Then we inspired to Musa, strike with your staff the sea. And it parted. And each portion was like a great towering mountain. This was a miracle. But this miracle came about when? When Musa alayhi salam affirmed his faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Inna ma'iyya rabbi, with me is my Lord. And remember, ma'iyya of Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with his servants. He is ma'akum aynama takunu. He is with you. And he knows what you're doing, wherever you are. You cannot exist without him. You cannot exist. You cannot live. You cannot do anything without his helping you and enabling you, without his allowing you. But remember, there is am ma'iyya, general ma'iyya, for all servants, but then there is the khas, the special ma'iyah, the special help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his special servants. Just as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the cave, he said, لا تحزن إن الله معنا That, oh Abu Bakr, don't be sad. Allah is with us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped him in the cave. And here Musa alayhi salam, he is trapped between Fir'aun and the water. And he says, Allah is with me. And Allah helped him. How? that the sea was parted and we advanced there to the pursuers. So Musa alayhi salam, Bani Israel, they went into the path through the water and Fir'aun and his army pursued them. And we saved Musa and those with him all together. Then we drowned the others. You see, it is important that we call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at such times. And that can only be when we believe in the might of Allah, the perfection of Allah, and his mercy. And that is what is mentioned here. Indeed, and that is a sign, a lesson, but most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is the exalted and might, the merciful. We can only call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at such times when we realize that our Lord is Al-Aziz, that our Lord is Al-Rahim. Who is Al-Aziz? Al-Aziz is the one who is mighty, who overcomes everything, and none can overcome him. Al-Aziz is the exalted, so none can reach his greatness. The unparalleled, so none is like him. And who is Rahim? Remember, Al-Rahim, the difference between the name Al-Rahim and Al-Rahman. Al-Rahim signifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's special mercy towards the believing servants. So what happened over here? Musa alayhi salam found himself trapped, but he called upon Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a way out for him because he is al-aziz, he's capable, he is al-rahim, he's especially merciful towards his believing servants. Ibn Qayyim said that there is no door that Allah closes with his wisdom except that he opens two with his mercy. Two with his mercy. And look at what happened over here. Two mercies came upon Musa alayhi salam. One is that yes, he found his way out. And the other was that his enemy, Fir'aun, was drowned. So that was also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. وَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأَ Ibrahim, And recite to them the news of Ibrahim. When he said to his father and his people, what is it that you worship? They said, we worship idols and remain to them devoted. He said, do they hear you when you supplicate? Or do they benefit you or do they harm very solid questions, real questions. They said, but we found our father is doing this. He said, then do you see what you have been worshiping? Are you just going to follow them or are you going to think about it yourself also? You and your ancient forefathers, indeed, they are enemies to me, except the Lord of the worlds. 
So I worship only the Lord of the worlds. Who is he? Alladhi khalaqani fahuwa yahdini. Who created me? And he it is who guides me. Walladhi huwa yut'imuni wa yasqini. And it is he who feeds me and gives me drink. Wa idha maridtu fahuwa yashfini. And when I am ill, it is he who cures me. I am ill because generally we fall ill because of our own ignorance. our own desires so who is it that heals us it is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who heals whether it is a spiritual emotional or physical problem allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who heals a man came and said to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam inni rajulun tabib i am a tabib meaning i'm a man who heals people and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allahu tabib it is allah who heals bal anta rajulun rafiq you are just a kind person a gentle person whereas healing it actually comes from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only and this is why when we are ill yes we take the medication and we go to the doctor etc but we believe that the real healing comes from who it actually comes from allah not from the means and this is why in illness we make dua imsah al ba's rabb al nas bi yadik al shifa لا كاشف له إلا أنت that in your hand is healing oh Allah and no one can remove this ailment except you so remember Allah is the one who gives healing to his servants through means and also without means sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives healing to his servants through means that they can see that they can understand like medication yani it makes sense for example this was the deficiency in the body and you take a medication to make up for that deficiency and now alhamdulillah body is fine right you understand the process but then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes heals his servants through ways that we cannot fully comprehend like for example yaqub alayhi salam's eyes yani he had become blind and how is it that his vision was restored not with medication not with surgery but with the shirt of yusuf alayhi salam subhanallah So it is Allah who heals. He is the source of healing. So this is why we should call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh Allah heal me. Oh Allah give me shifa. Once a child was brought to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that child's arm had gotten terribly burnt. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam applied his saliva on the burn and he made dua for that child he said azhi bil ba's rabb an nas wa shfi anta shafi la shifa illa shifauk shifa an la yughadir saqama so these are duas that we can find in you know different books different apps and these are duas that we should use because as we can see these days we don't always have a pill have a treatment for every sickness we don't have a vaccine for every sickness we don't we don't have the means always so healing is truly in the hand of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never ever forget that and who will cause me to die and then bring me to life and who i aspire that he will forgive me my sin on the day of recompense this dua is also very important that oh allah i hope that you will forgive me my sins on the day of judgment we learned that there was a man hisham ibn mughira who did many works of charity yani he was famous for his philanthropy but he never said this dua that rabbi ighfir li khati'ati yawm ad-din so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that his deeds will not benefit him and then ibrahim alayhi salam made dua he said rabbi hab li hukman wa alhiqni bis salihin my lord grant me authority grant me wisdom and join me with the righteous what a beautiful dua grant me hukm wisdom the ability to do the right thing at the right time to make the right decisions to be decisive and so often in our lives we suffer because we are indecisive or because we're constantly making wrong decisions and you know indecision can really make us extremely anxious so it's important that we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh allah grant me hukm and then he prayed for righteous company in this life and in the next life because good friends are really a blessing you feel secure around them you feel at ease around them وجعل لي لسان الصدق في الاخرين and grant me a reputation of honor among later generations meaning that after i am gone i am still mentioned in a good way that people take me as a good example a model and this should be لسان الصدق يعني truthful not false not that people think that i am so righteous but my reality is completely different 
No, lisan al-sidiqin. Waj'alli min warathati jannatin na'im. And place me among the inheritors of the gardens of pleasure. And forgive my father. Indeed, he has been of those astray. And do not disgrace me on the day they are all resurrected. Meaning, save me from being humiliated because of my father. And this is why his father will not come on the day of judgment in his own form. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change his form so that it would not hurt Ibrahim alayhi salam. The day when there will not benefit anyone, wealth or children, illa man atallaha biqalbin salim, but only one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. And this is why our ultimate focus in this life should be the health of our heart. We are very, very obsessed with the health of our wealth, the well-being of our wealth, the growth of our wealth, and that of our children. Yes, that is important. This is amana that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. But our heart deserves a lot of attention also. Because on the day of judgment, that is what will benefit us. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ told us that the iman of the slave cannot be upright until his heart is upright. So if the heart is sound, the body is sound. In this life, the actions will be good. In the grave, a person will be safe. And in the hereafter, also the person will be safe. Because we learned that in the grave, a person's good deeds will protect him from the punishment. So those good deeds, a person is only able to do them if the heart is good. So our well-being depends on the well-being of our heart. So it is important that we do something about that. And the question is, what is the sound heart? But Dr. Saleh as sindhi he explains that the Salim heart, the sound heart, has five characteristics. The first is that it has aslama, meaning that it has become submissive to Allah. It has aslama lillah. Secondly, that it has sallama littiba'i rasulillah, that it has given itself up to, meaning it has given authority to the command of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thirdly, that it has istaslama li qada'illahi wa qadari, that it has completely resigned and surrendered itself to Allah's decree, meaning it is completely accepting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decisions. Then fourthly, it has salima, min kulli ma yaqta'uhu anillahi wa dhikri. That it has escaped and has become safe by getting away from everything that comes between it and Allah and his remembrance. And then finally, the fifth is that it has salama, meaning salama awliya Allah. That it has reconciled with itself and with the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a salim heart that has surrendered to Allah, that has accepted the authority of the Messenger of Allah, that has fully resigned to the decree of Allah, and that it has fled from everything that comes between it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it has made peace with the righteous servants of Allah also. So we learn that the Prophet ﷺ was asked that which people are the best. And he said, the best of people is every person who has a clean heart and a truthful tongue. And he said, mahmoom al-qalb. So the people said, we know what truthful tongue is, but what is mahmoom al-qalb? What is this clean heart? He said, every heart that is God-fearing, because it has surrendered to Allah, and it is clean, in which is no sin, rebellion, hatred, or jealousy. Yani, neither is he angry with the decree of Allah, nor is he angry with the friends of Allah. Rather, it is at peace. So a person who is at peace here will be at peace there. And remember, Salim is also someone who has survived, meaning a snake bit them, but they didn't die because of that. And yes, there are trials in this life, difficulties, very, very painful situations in this life. But when a person holds on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they remember that Allah is there. So they, يَعْتَصِمُ billah. He clings to Allah, holds on to Allah, then such a person survives. And that is what we need. And that is what we should pray for. وَأَسْأَلُكَ قَلْبًا سَلِيمًا يَا رَبْ Give me a heart that is sound. Some of the righteous, they would say that the soundness of the heart is with five things. And what is that? First of all, the recitation of the Qur'an with reflection. Secondly, eating little, meaning keeping the stomach empty, meaning allowing your stomach to be empty at certain times. Thirdly, praying in the night, standing in prayer in the night. Then 
التضرع بالسحر تضرع بالسحر meaning calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with humility at the time of sahur and then finally being in the company of the righteous these are things that help a person have a clean heart and paradise will be brought near that day to the righteous and hellfire will be brought forth for the deviators and it will be said to them where are those you used to worship other than Allah can they help you or help themselves so they will be overturned into hellfire they and the deviators and the soldiers of Iblis all together who are the soldiers of Iblis, those who follow him, they will say, while they dispute therein, by Allah, we were indeed in manifest error. When we equated you with the Lord of the worlds, then they will admit, and no one misguided us except the criminals. So now we have no intercessors and not a devoted friend. Wala sadiqin hameem. Then if we only had a return to the world and could be of the believers, Indeed, and that is a sign, but most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is the exalted in might, the merciful. The people of Nuh denied the messengers. When their brother Nuh said to them, will you not fear Allah? Indeed, I am to you a trustworthy messenger. So fear Allah and obey me. And I do not ask you for it any payment. My payment is only from the Lord of the worlds. So fear Allah and obey me. They said, should we believe you while you are followed by the lowest class of people? He said, and what is my knowledge of what they used to do? Their account is only upon my Lord, if you could perceive. And I am not one to drive away the believers. I am only a clear warner. They said, if you do not desist, O Nur, you will surely be of those who are stoned. We will kill you. He said, my Lord, indeed, my people have denied me. Then judge between me and them with decisive judgment and save me and those with me of the believers. So he saved him and those with him in the laden ship. Then we drowned thereafter the remaining ones. Indeed, and that is a sign, but most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is the exalted and mighty the merciful Ad denied the messengers when their brother Hud said to them will you not fear Allah indeed I am to you a trustworthy messenger so fear Allah and obey me and I do not ask you for it any payment my payment is only from the Lord of the worlds do you construct on every elevation a sign amusing yourselves and you're just preoccupied with worldly things and take for yourselves palaces and fortresses that you might abide eternally, meaning you have made your homes such that, you know, as if you are going to live here forever. So all of your focus and attention and your time and energy and resources and your mental, you know, capacity, all of it is dedicated to your homes. Are you going to abide here eternally? And when you strike, you strike as tyrants. So fear Allah and obey me. And fear he who provided you with that which you know, provided you with grazing livestock and children and gardens and springs. Indeed, I fear for you the punishment of a terrible day. Look at their response. They said, it is all the same to us, whether you advise us or are not of the advisors. We are not going to listen to you. This is not but the custom of the former peoples. And we are not to be punished. You're just, you know, saying this to make us afraid. We don't believe you. And they denied him. So he destroyed them. Indeed, and that is a sign, but most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is the exalted in might, the merciful. Again, this is being repeated. Thamud denied the messengers. When their brother Salih said to them, Will you not fear Allah? Indeed, I am to you a trustworthy messenger. So fear Allah and obey me. And I do not ask you for it any payment. My payment is only from the Lord of the worlds. <inaudible> Will you be left in what is here secure from death? Meaning, do you think you're going to live here forever in this security? It's not going to last forever. You think you're going to be here forever within gardens and springs and fields of crops and palm trees with softened fruit? And you carve out of the mountains homes with skill. So fear Allah and obey me and do not obey the order of the transgressors who cause corruption in the land and do not amend. Meaning your role models should be those who do islah, meaning who make amends, not those who cause corruption. They said, you are only of those affected by magic. You are but a man like ourselves. So bring a sign if you should be of the truthful. He said, this is a she camel. For her is a time of drink and for you is a time of drink, each on a known day. 
They had to take turns and do not touch her with harm, lest you be seized by the punishment of a terrible day. But they didn't care. They hamstrung her and so became regretful. And the punishment seized them. Indeed, and that is a sign. But most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is the exalted in might, the merciful. The people of Luke denied the messengers. When their brother Luke said to them, will you not fear Allah? Indeed, I am to you a trustworthy messenger. So fear Allah and obey me. And I do not ask you for it any payment. My payment is only from the Lord of the worlds. Do you approach males among the worlds and leave what your Lord has created for you as mates? But you are a people transgressing. Remember, if the haram is tempting, it is accessible. It doesn't mean that you are obligated or you are being compelled to indulge in it. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us with different desires and with different options that are made available to us. So it is up to us what we choose And that is what we will be held accountable for. We will not be held accountable for the desire that we have in our heart. Because that is not always by choice. We will be held accountable for the choices that we make. They said, if you do not desist, O Lut, you will surely be of those evicted. We will kick you out. You will not be allowed to stay here. He said, indeed, I am toward your deed of those who detest it. He said, I do not accept this action of yours. I detest this deed of yours. And this is very important for every believer. My Lord, save me and my family from the consequence of what they do. So we saved him and his family, all except an old woman among those who remained behind. And she was a woman. She didn't participate in this deed herself. But because she agreed with it, she supported it. She was destroyed with them. Then we destroyed the others and we rained upon them a rain of stones and evil was the rain of those who were warned. Indeed, and that is a sign, but most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is the exalted in might, the merciful. The companion. The companions of the thicket of the four. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you all doing? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you all doing? The companions of the thicket of the forest denied the messengers. When Shuraib said to them, will you not fear Allah? Indeed, I am to you a trustworthy messenger. So fear Allah and obey me. If you look at these stories, the same message was given by prophet after prophet after prophet. 
and I do not ask you for it any payment. My payment is only from the Lord of the worlds. Give full measure and do not be of those who cause loss, meaning don't cheat, don't be dishonest and weigh with an even balance and do not deprive people of their due and do not commit abuse on earth, spreading corruption and fear he who created you and the former creation. They said, you are only of those affected by magic. The people also responded in the same way. Human nature is the same. You are but a man like ourselves. And indeed, we think you are among the liars. You've just made all of this up yourself. So cause to fall upon us fragments of the sky if you should be of the truthful. He said, my Lord is most knowing of what you do. And they denied him. So the punishment of the day of the black cloud seized them. Indeed, it was the punishment of a terrible day. Indeed, and that is a sign, but most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is the exalted in might, the merciful. These verses are repeated eight times in the surah. Eight times. That in the people of the past and in the creation that is around you, there are signs. Yet majority of the people fail to benefit from those signs. And these signs, they reflect the might of Allah and the mercy of Allah, both at the same time. But yet people fail to recognize their Lord. And indeed, the Quran is the revelation of the Lord of the worlds. And this is enough virtue that Allah is the one who has revealed this book. The trustworthy spirit has brought it down. More virtue of this book. The best angel delivered it. Angel Jibreel. When? Beginning the revelation process in the best month, in the best night of the year. Upon your heart, which is the best part of the human body. لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنْزِرِينَ That you may be of the warners. So it was revealed upon the best of the creation, a human being, and among them also the best person, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam given to the best nation, in the best city. Yani this Qur'an is only virtuous. It's only important in every aspect. So truly unfortunate are those who fail to see the virtue of this Qur'an and thereby fail to benefit from the good which is in this Qur'an in a clear Arabic language. And this shows us the importance of learning the Qur'an in Arabic because this is mentioned so many times in the Qur'an. So remember, the person who learns the Qur'an then and teaches it, the Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ When this Qur'an is so important, then any person who learns it and then they teach it, even if it's just recitation of it, then such a person becomes the best. And indeed, it is mentioned in the scriptures of former peoples, meaning in the previous scriptures also, the good news of the final scripture was given. How important is this book then? And has it not been assigned to them that it is recognized by the scholars of the children of Israel? Didn't Waraqa bin Nawfal recognize it? And even if we had revealed it to one among the foreigners, being a non-Arab, and he had recited it to them perfectly, they would still not have been believers in it. Thus have we inserted disbelief into the hearts of the criminals. They come up with one excuse or another. So they will not believe in it until they see the painful punishment. And it will come to them suddenly while they perceive it not. And they will say, may we be reprieved? Can we have another chance? Can we have some time? So for our punishment, are they impatient? Then have you considered if we gave them enjoyment for years and then there came to them that which they were promised, they would not be availed by the enjoyment with which they were provided. So no matter how long a person enjoys life in this world, it is not going to ultimately benefit a person. So our main goal should be the life of the hereafter. And we did not destroy any city except that it had warners. As a reminder, and never have we been unjust. And the devils have not brought the revelation down because this is what the people of Makkah would say. It is not allowable for them, nor would they be able. Indeed, they from its hearing are far removed, meaning shayateen are kept away from even listening to the Quran. So do not invoke with Allah another deity and thus be among the punished. And warn your closest kindred. Worry about them. Tell them 
And the Prophet ﷺ did warn his family. Right after this verse was revealed, he got up and he went and he said, Oh Quraysh, save yourselves. I cannot save you from Allah. He said, Oh Bani Abd Munaf, I cannot save you from Allah. Oh Abbas, I cannot save you. Oh Safiya, I cannot save you. Oh Fatima, I cannot save you. You have to save yourself. And lower your wing to those who follow you of the believers. We see that the Prophet ﷺ was given this instruction many times in the Quran. That be humble with the believers. Meaning be approachable. Don't be, you know, up in the sky like a flying bird. Don't be so unapproachable and scary and arrogant that they're afraid to be around you. Rather welcome them. And if they disobey you, then say, indeed, I am dissociated from what you are doing. And rely upon the exalted in might, the merciful. This is the ninth time the names Al-Aziz, Al-Rahim are appearing together in the surah. Earlier we learned, وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ Your Lord is indeed, surely He is the mighty, the merciful. And here it is said, Rely upon Al-Aziz Al-Rahim. Why? Because there is no safety except with Al-Aziz. الذي يراك حين تقوم Who sees you when you arise. Meaning when you get up. Meaning from your sleep. Or when you get up to stand before people to address them. Or when you're standing in prayer. Allah is looking at you. وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ And your movement among those who prostrate. So he watches you when you're alone. He watches you when you are amongst people and when you worship Allah. إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Indeed, he is the hearing, the knowing. The people of Mecca said that this Qur'an is just poetry. And that, you know, some shayateen, some jinn, they inspire Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Astaghfirullah. So it is said, shall I inform you upon whom the devils descend? They descend upon every sinful liar. The Prophet ﷺ is not a liar, and you know him. They pass on what is heard. They pass on what is heard, meaning without any confirmation. And most of them are liars. And the poets, only the deviators follow them. And remember, the poets were the you know the speakers of that time, any people who were very famous. So only the deviators follow them. Do you not see that in every valley they roam? Meaning when they're saying their poetry, they talk about all sorts of random things. Yani in one sentence, in one phrase, they will bring every valley together. Yani every aspect together. And that they say what they do not do. Meaning what they say is not realistic at all. It is far from reality. And the Quran is not like that. Except those poets who believe and do righteous deeds and remember Allah often and defend after they were wronged. And those who have wronged are going to know what kind of return they will be returned. So we see that apparently it seems that poetry is being condemned. But remember that all poetry is not bad. Because poetry can actually be very, very effective. It can be excellent for self-expression and also for teaching important concepts. And this is why we see that there were people at the time of the Prophet wasallam who were great poets. And when they used that poetry in the way of Allah to defend Islam, to defend the Prophet wasallam, that was welcomed. But when people used poetry to just waste their time and to delve into useless things, then this kind of poetry is what is being condemned over here. So the Prophet ﷺ said, it is better for a man to fill the inside of his body with pus than to fill it with poetry. And this is something that we need to be careful about also. Because you see, the songs that we listen to, the rhymes that we listen to, they get stuck in our head. So at one time, you know, either it's those soundtracks or those songs that are playing in your head, or it is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be careful of what you listen to, because that will certainly have an impact on your thinking. Surah An-Naml. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Taseen. These are the verses of the Quran and a clear book as guidance and good tidings for the believers. This is the Qur'an, Hudan wa Bushra, who establish prayer and give zakat, and of the hereafter, they are certain in faith. These are the people who benefit from the Qur'an. On the contrary, indeed, for those who do not believe in the hereafter, we have made pleasing to them their deeds, so they wander blindly. Those are the ones for whom there will be the worst of punishment. And in the hereafter, 
they are the greatest losers. Why? Because they never prepared for it. And indeed, you receive the Qur'an from who? Especially from the one who is Hakim and Alim, who is wise and knowing. You see how over and over again, through different ways, we are being taught the worth, the status, the importance of the book of Allah. That this Qur'an is from Allah, who is Hakim, who is Alim. And this is not the word of a human being. This is the word of Allah. And Allah is most wise. And he, he is the one who has decided everything for you, about you in your life and in this world. This is his hukum, which prevails. And he is alim, he is knowing of everything. Do you doubt his words? Any, you have hesitation in accepting and following and reading his words? Why deprive yourself? إِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِأَهْلِهِ Mention when Musa said to his family, Indeed, I have perceived a fire. I will bring you from their information or will bring you a burning torch that you may warm yourselves. And this ayah is a testament to the care that Musa السلام, had for those around him. How he took care of his family and then after that his people. But when he came to it, he was called, Blessed is whoever is at the fire. And whoever is around it was subhanallah rabbil alameen and exalted is Allah, Lord of the worlds. Subhanallah rabbil alameen. This is also a way in which we can glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Generally, when we say tasbih, we say subhanallah or subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al azim. And this is also a way, subhanallah rabbil alameen. In fact, we learn that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say this in the night. That in the night, Rabi'a ibn Ka'b, he said that I would sometimes spend the night outside the door of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I could hear him saying in the night, Subhanallah Rabbil Alameen. And he would repeat that for a while. So we should also repeat these words, especially when we're trying to fall asleep. O Musa, indeed it is I, Allah, the exalted in might, the wise. And he was told, throw down your staff. But when he saw it moving as if it were a snake, he turned in flight and did not return. Allah said, O Musa, fear not. Indeed, in my presence, the messengers do not fear. Otherwise, he who wrongs then substitutes good for evil. Indeed, I am forgiving and merciful. Musa alayhi salam, he had made a huge mistake in his past. He had killed a man by accident. And a person who is very honest with themselves, a person of good conscience, for them, their mistakes, they linger on. They don't just forget about them. So it is as if his mistake was being hinted at, that you don't need to be afraid now because, yes, you made a mistake, but then you substituted it with good. You replaced that evil with something good. So a person who follows a bad deed with a good one or who fixes the mistake that he made, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving and merciful towards them. And this is so encouraging because we cannot be perfect. We will definitely make mistakes. Any there's mistakes we make unintentionally, accidentally. We meant to do something else and we end up doing something else because we're human. We're completely imperfect. But then look at the way out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for us. Illa man zalama thumma baddala husnan ba'da su. Replace that evil with something good and put your hand into the opening of your garment. It will come out white without disease. These are among the nine signs you will take to Fir'aun and his people. Indeed, they have been a people defiantly disobedient. But when there came to them our visible signs, they said this is obvious magic and they rejected them while their inner selves were convinced thereof. They knew inside that it was true. It was not magic. They knew inside that this was divine, this was miracle, but they still rejected out of injustice and arrogance. So see, how was the end of the corruptors? وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا دَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ عِلْمًا And we had certainly given to Dawood and Sulaiman knowledge. Subhanallah. Allah had given them many blessings. They were kings, they were prophets, they had their own unique strengths and miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed them with. But out of all the things, what's the first thing that is mentioned here? The fact that Allah gave them knowledge. So remember, the blessing, the virtue of knowledge is above other blessings. 
you need knowledge is more important to other blessings that you have been given. This is why the Prophet ﷺ was told, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا That say, O oh my Lord, increase me in my knowledge. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, أَلَا إِنَّ الدُّنْيَا مَلْعُونَ Unquestionably, indeed the world is cursed. What is in it is cursed. Except for the dhikr of Allah, the remembrance of Allah. And what is conducive to that, meaning what helps you, what is an assistant to you in remembering Allah, in worshipping Him. And wa'aliman aw muta'alliman. And a knowledgeable person and the person who is learning, the person who is studying. Yani these people are not cursed. Otherwise, everything else in the world, it is mal'una, it is cursed, which means that, you know, it, it is attached with problems and discomfort and and all of that and it is something whose benefit will not continue for long but when it comes to knowledge and when it comes to the dhikr of Allah then this is something that will continue to benefit a person forever so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Dawood and Sulaiman and the fact that Allah gave them knowledge and they said praise is due to Allah who has favored us over many of his believing servants they were given ilm, and real ilm is that a person remains humble to Allah. This is real knowledge, that a person thanks and praises Allah. Knowledge doesn't mean that a person does not have time for ibadah. No, when a person is truly knowledgeable, then they worship Allah. They glorify and they praise Allah. When a person is truly knowledgeable, they understand that what they know is from Allah. So they remain humble. And Sulaiman inherited Dawood. He said, oh people, we have been taught the language of birds. SubhanAllah. And we have been given from all things. Indeed, this is evident bounty. You see, he is telling his people that Allah has given us these privileges. He's not boasting here. He's not making them proud here. Rather, he is reminding them that this is al-fadlul mubin. This is Allah's evident favor on us that we should not take for granted and gathered for Sulaiman were his soldiers of the jinn and men and birds. What a massive army that must have been. And they were marching in rows, meaning they were organized. It was not a random crowd. Until when they came upon the valley of the ants and ants said, oh ants, enter your dwellings that you not be crushed by Sulaiman and his soldiers while they perceive not. Subhanallah. An ant recognized Sulaiman alayhi salam. And remember that an ant colony is actually a nation among the nations that glorify Allah. That is how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam described it. So this ant, you know, it didn't blame Sulaiman alayhi salam. It said that perhaps they will trample over you while they perceive not because they are not able to see you. So Sulaiman alayhi salam, because Allah made him hear the conversation of the end, Sulaiman alayhi salam smiled, amused at her speech. And this shows us that the prophets of Allah would smile. Even the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would smile a lot. In fact, he would smile more than anyone else. And he would laugh, but occasionally. Sometimes he would laugh to the point that his molars could be seen, but never with his mouth open so wide that his uvula could be seen. So remember, LOL, laughing out loud, this is not from the sunnah. The Prophet wasallam, he did not laugh mustajmi'an, meaning as if his entire body was involved, like really laughing uncontrollably. That was not the way of the Prophet wasallam. So smiling is a sunnah. It is an act of charity. It doesn't break your fast. However, smiling must be according to the sunnah also. So Sulaiman Alaihissalam smiled. He was amused at her speech and said, My Lord, Rabbi Auzirni and Ashkura Nirmatakalati and Amta Alaya, Wa ala walidaya, wa an armala salihan tarda, wa adhili bi rahmati kafi ibadi kasalihin. He said, My Lord, enable me. You control me to be grateful for your favor which you have bestowed upon me. As if he is asking Allah, Ya Allah, you control me, that I don't want to become arrogant. So allow me to be grateful for your favor which you have bestowed upon me and upon my parents and allow me to do righteousness of which you approve. And this should be our concern that we do actions which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with and admit me by your mercy into the ranks of your righteous servants. What a great king and look at his humility.
And he took attendance of the birds and said, why do I not see the hoopoe? Or is he among the absent? Meaning he noticed one bird, hudhud, it was missing. Subhanallah. I will surely punish him with a severe punishment or slaughter him unless he brings me clear authorization. So we see that Sulaiman a.s. he was a great king of a great kingdom, but he was also very, very vigilant and very, very aware and he was also very firm about the rules. But the hupu, the hudhud, stayed not long and said, I have encompassed in knowledge that which you have not encompassed. And I have come to you from Saba with certain news. Indeed, I found there a woman ruling them. And she has been given of all things. And she has a great throne. I found her and her people prostrating to the sun instead of Allah. And shaitan has made their deeds pleasing to them and averted them from his way. So they are not guided. And so they do not prostrate to Allah who brings forth what is hidden within the heavens and the earth and knows what you conceal and what you declare. Allah, there is no deity except him, Lord of the great throne. Subhanallah, this is a bird. And look at the bird's observation. Birds are truly fascinating creatures and their vision, their observation, and it's amazing. Because you see, it said, I have encompassed what you did not encompass. And really, birds are able to see what we are not able to see. Amazing. Sulaiman said, we will see whether you were truthful or were of the liars. Meaning we will investigate. Take this letter of mine and deliver it to them. Then leave them and see what answer they will return. She said, O eminent ones, indeed to me has been delivered a noble letter. Indeed, it is from Sulaiman. And indeed, it reads in the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. So please, when you send a letter, give a note to someone, send a message, make sure that you identify yourself. Sulaiman said, this is from Sulaiman. And begin with the name of Allah. And what was the message? Be not haughty, be not arrogant with me, but come to me in submission as Muslims. Because remember, he was a prophet of Allah. And so he invited them over here from a position of strength and power, because that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him. She said, O oh, eminent ones, advise me in my affair. I would not decide a matter until you witness for me. She takes their suggestions. And this is so important. If you really want to lead people, truly lead them, you know, lead their hearts, then it is important that everybody feels heard and everybody feels involved. It should not be a dictatorship, even at home. You know, sometimes what happens is that when it comes to cooking food, we just prepare whatever we want and we tell people, well, you know what, too bad, like it or leave it. You need to take people's suggestions, get them to be on the same page, whether it is a small matter or a big one. So we can see how she's not hasty. She's very deliberate. They said, we are men of strength and of great military might. But the command is yours, so see what you will command. We will accept your decision. She said, indeed, kings, when they enter a city, they ruin it and render the honored of its people humbled. And thus do they do. So it's better to come to some agreement, some kind of compromise instead of conflict. But indeed, I will send to them a gift and see with what reply the messengers will return. Again, we see that she is also very deliberate. She's not hasty. Qatada said, may Allah have mercy on her. She was very wise, both in shirk and in Islam. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said that she said to her people that if Sulaiman accepts the gift, then he is an average king. And then you can easily fight him. But if he doesn't accept it, then he is different. Then he is really a prophet, as he says. So we will obey him then. So when they came to Sulaiman, he said, do you provide me with wealth? But what Allah has given me is better than what he has given you. Meaning, I'm not in need of this wealth of yours, these gifts. Rather, it is you who rejoice in your gift. Return to them, for we will surely come to them with soldiers that they will be powerless to encounter. And we will surely expel them therefrom in humiliation, and they will be debased. Sulaiman said, O assembly of jinn, which of you will bring me her throne before they come to me in submission? A powerful one from among the jinn said, I will bring it to you before you rise from your place. And indeed, I am for this task, strong and trustworthy. Meaning you can trust me, I am capable of this. And I can bring it to you within, you know, a couple of hours before you get up from this meeting of yours. But then, said one who had knowledge from the scripture, he said, I will bring it to you before your glance returns to you. Meaning within a blink. 
You see, ilm, knowledge, is better than physical power because one is able to accomplish with knowledge what they cannot accomplish with physical power alone. So it is said that this was Jibreel who had knowledge of the book of the scripture and that is how he's praised over here. And when Suleiman saw the throne placed before him, he said, this is from the favor of my Lord. This is entirely Allah's favor on me. I am neither worthy of it nor capable of it on my own, nor have I done anything because of which I deserve this favor of my Lord. This is truly his favor upon me. And why is this favor given to me? To test me whether I will be grateful or ungrateful. And whoever is grateful, his gratitude is only for the benefit of himself. And whoever is ungrateful, then indeed my Lord is free of need and generous. So we see here that at tahaddusu bi ni'matillah, talking about the blessing of Allah. Remember, this is part of gratitude. And not talking about Allah's blessings shows that we don't recognize them, that we are not acknowledging them. He said, disguise for her her throne. We will see whether she will be guided to truth or will be of those who is not guided. You see that Suleiman Islam is very deliberate and he's constantly testing. And we see that the Queen of Sheba also, she was also very deliberate. So when she arrived, it was said to her, is your throne like this? She said, it is as though it was it. So we see over here, Yani Suleiman Islam showed her a miracle by having the throne brought before she arrived. And we were given knowledge before her, and we have been Muslims in submission to Allah. And that which she was worshipping other than Allah had averted her, meaning before from submitting to Allah. Indeed, she was from a disbelieving people. And that is why she was like that. But once she came to know of the truth, what happened? She was told, enter the palace. But when she saw it, she thought it was a body of water and uncovered her shins to wade through. Again, we see she was not hasty. She was very deliberate and careful. So he said, indeed, it is a palace whose floor is made smooth with glass. And it was so shiny that it was reflecting the image. So she thought it was wet. She said, my Lord, indeed, I have wronged myself. And I submit with Suleiman to the Lord of the worlds. So here, yes, she recognized the superiority of Suleiman, but she didn't just surrender. She believed in Allah. She recognized the superiority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what the prophets came to do. Whatever they had, they used their power, their privilege, their resources to help people recognize the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not their own personal glory. And we had certainly sent to Thamud, their brother Salih, saying, worship Allah. And at once, there were two parties conflicting. He said, oh, my people, why are you impatient for evil instead of good? Why do you not seek forgiveness of Allah that you may receive mercy? They said, we consider you a bad omen, you and those with you. He said, your omen is with Allah. Rather, you are a people being tested. And there were in the city nine family heads causing corruption in the land and not amending its affairs. They said, take a mutual oath by Allah that we will kill him by night, he and his family. Then we will say to his executor, we did not witness the destruction of his family. We will lie, and indeed we are truthful. And they planned a plan, and we planned a plan while they perceived not. And the people of Makkah came up with a very similar plan to kill the Prophet wasallam. But then look, how was the outcome of their plan? They failed that we destroyed them and their people all. And the Prophet wasallam also, he fled Makkah, he left Makkah in peace and security. So those are their houses, desolate because of the wrong they had done. Indeed, and that is a sign for people who know. You see here, Khawiyatan bima walamu. Ibn Abbas said, I find in Allah's book that injustice destroys homes. And he recited this verse. So remember, injustice, oppression is something unlawful. And it ruins the family. So any kind of injustice, whether it is verbal or it is physical against a spouse or children, it is not going to allow the house or the family to stay together. Injustice destroys. And we saved those who believed and used to fear Allah. And mentioned Lut when he said to his people, do you commit immorality while you are seeing? Do you indeed approach men with desire instead of women? Rather, you are a people behaving ignorantly. But the answer of his people was not except that they said, expel the family of Lut from your city. Indeed, there are people who keep themselves pure. So we saved him and his family except for his wife. We destined her to be of those who remained behind. And we rained upon them a rain of stones and evil 
example was the reign of those who were warned. Qulil alhamdulillah. Say all praise be to Allah. Wa salamun ala ibadihi alladhina astafa. And may peace be upon his servants whom he has chosen. Allahu khairun amma yushrikun. Ask them, is Allah better? or what they associate with him. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is taught to say this, and we should also say this, that first all praises to Allah, and then peace and blessings upon Allah's chosen servants. Why? Why should we say this, especially when, you know, a khutbah or a speech is begun to seek the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And generally also, this is a fact that we should remember, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he sent messengers, he sent messengers to guide people, so all praise to Allah for his kindness, for his mercy, for his generosity. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless those people who endured such great difficulty, who were so patient in conveying God's message to mankind. Wasalamun ala ibadihi ladina stafa. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyina Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah, we'll conclude over here. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Okay, Alhamdulillah, we've completed Jews 19, Ashallah, Barakallah Fikum. Okay, so before uh, we begin uh, review, just wanted to announce that the, uh, the Jews 18 quiz has been fixed. So Jazakumullah Khair and everyone for your patience with that. So inshallah, you can attempt it whenever you are able to. Okay, so let's we shall start our review. نحن نسأل على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب إشرح لي صدري وسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. This is a very quick lesson, inshallah, from Surah Naml, ayah number eighteen and nineteen. Until when they came upon the valley of the ants, and ants said, "O oh, ants, enter your dwelling that you." that you not be crushed by Sulaiman and his soldiers while they perceive not. Okay, so what advice did the ant give to the other ants? And subhanAllah, this shows us the intelligence of the ants as well. Said to go home, right? Because you could be killed, right? Yeah, get out of the way, you're gonna be crushed. Yes, subhanAllah, even the ant can perceive. But, and then she says at the end, you might be crushed while they perceive not. So what type of thinking of this, of the ant? Yeah, they're caring for each other, subhanAllah, very true. Yes. She is thinking positive, right? That they might hurt you, while they don't even realize it, right? So she's not assuming that all humans are terrible, right? Because all they do is come by, crush us and leave. She's saying that they don't even notice and they might hurt you. Yeah, subhanAllah, precautions, positive approach. Yeah, ants know he can't understand them, subhanAllah. No blame, no blame. Right now, we you may have heard of that saying of the scholar, it gives 70 excuses. Right? When someone does something wrong, when someone hurts you, then instead of just blaming them and assuming wrong of them, give them 70 excuses. Right? So in one of those, you will find <laughs> subhanAllah a way to inshallah forgive them. Yes. But yeah, exactly. We jump to conclusions first, right? So, so many lessons from this ant, right? And like you all mentioned these already, mashallah, the care and concern for other ants, right? So how are we? This is an ant, something that subhanAllah, we find irritating when um, they invade our homes, right? 
but this is an ant that we don't think much of, but see how much care and concern, right? How much care and concern for those around. Yes, subhanAllah, they're so hardworking, very true. And then subhanAllah, we see the wisdom of the ant. Right? What a wise ant, subhanAllah. She gives the warning and she gives them the reason for it. Right? And then she gives them the strategy. She tells them what to do. Right? She warned them and subhanAllah, she gave everyone a positive thought. They give the benefit of the doubt. Right? What is our reaction when things don't go how we want them to? SubhanAllah, we turn everyone's thinking to negative. Right? Everyone around us starts to think negatively. And we put that thought there. Right? So be like the ant. Yes, we get angry, you complain, we blame others. Yes, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa enable us to um, use this strategy as well, right, with our family members, inshallah. Right, so when we are faced with some situation that is not pleasing to us, then inshallah, we need to adopt these qualities as well. Give others the benefit of the doubt and don't, astaghfirullah, change everyone's mood and way of thinking around us, right? Keep everyone positive. Keep everyone positive so that, inshallah, um, we are able to not take that sin on, right? Because sometimes we're wrong, right? We assume someone else is wrong, but we're the ones who's wrong. Okay? And now we've backbited, we've complained, we've, astaghfirullah, uh, changed the way everyone else was thinking, right? So we've, because of one mistake, right, we've taken on so many other sins as well. Yes, it affects a lot, exactly. It affects a lot. And then let's take a look at Suleiman and Islam's reaction. He smiled, amused at her speech and said, my Lord, enable me to be grateful for your favor and which you have bestowed upon me and my parents and do righteousness of which you approve and admit me by your mercy into the ranks of your servants. Suleiman and Islam had so many blessings. So many blessings, but does he just, subhanAllah, get amused and then tell the fellow um, army around him, hey, look, this is what's happening. So cool. I can hear it and I understand it all. SubhanAllah, no. Immediately makes dua. And what a beautiful, beautiful dua. It's, so first of all, he smiles. So we see that he's a friendly person. Okay? He smiles. He smiles. Why? Because he understood the language. And because of the wisdom that he heard from the end. Right? So both things, subhanAllah, made him smile. He has good humor. So he's happy, right? That Allah subhanAllah has blessed him with this ability. And he's smiling. And then also because of what he heard. The ant say. And then we see that there's no arrogance. He's completely humbled that he has this uh, ability. Right? And he makes dua. What does he make dua for? Subhanallah, grant me the ability to be grateful. What a dua. When we are grateful, is there any benefit? It just improves everything around us, yes? Subhanallah. Right? When we're grateful, then subhanallah, it radiates. Okay? Those around us become more grateful as well. No arrogance, subhanAllah. Instead, he asks Allah to give him the ability to be even more grateful. And what is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When we are grateful, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do for us? Yes, he gives us more. Barakallah fikum. Right? So isn't this the perfect dua? Asking Allah to give us the ability to be grateful so that we can get even more, subhanAllah. Right? And so grateful for what? The favors upon himself and upon his parents. Why his parents? Of course, we understand when we have a lot of good things, but why is it important to be grateful for the favors on our parents? They raised us, yes. We came from them. 
whatever they had is what made us who we are today, right? So whatever blessings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave your parents, you benefited from them, right? If your parents had had any abilities, right? Whether it was the ability to, subhanAllah, um, teach you any good, whether it was the ability to go out and go to work, whether it was the ability to, subhanAllah, be available when you needed them, right? All of this is a favor from Allah upon them, right? Yes, to be able to stand on your feet. Right. So all of it was given to them from Allah, and in turn, that was given to you, right? Because whatever our parents have is, subhanAllah, a benefit for us as well, right? And then he asked for deeds, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approves of, right? This is something very important. We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds, but only deeds that are done the right way are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So that means our intention and the deed itself has to be according to the Quran and the Sunnah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Jia. And admit me by your mercy. Where does he ask? To be with the righteous servants, right? So the righteous servants will be gathered in paradise. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us there as well. And may he accept this dua on behalf of all of us, inshallah. Okay. Um, can we recite one surah like Ikhlas 10? To 12 times in Raqqa? Yes, um, yes, you can. We find the Prophet ﷺ would repeat um, an ayah in Salah, right? and he repeated it multiple, multiple times. So yes, if we would like to repeat a surah, we can. Inshallah. Okay, so let's conclude here, and inshallah, we see you all tomorrow. Okay, for Jews 20, mashallah. Barakallah fikum. Jazakum al khairan, everyone, for your attendance and for your participation subhanak allahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh um yes please retake juz 18 i uh, we apologize for um the mix up um getting too conscious too to kill ants who are showing up in the kitchen no if the if the ants are in your home and they will cause harm um then we're uh, we're allowed to remove them from our home so that there's no nothing wrong with that. But if they are living their own lives, you know, in your backyard and they're not bothering you, um, then leave them alone. Okay. But if they can cause harm, then yes, we are uh, we have full right to um, remove them. Okay. Inshallah. Okay. Um, Sister Thaymiya said Jibreel salam about this all. Okay. Um, if you're a registered student, you will do the quizzes. Okay, so if you'd like to do the quizzes, then register as a student, and inshallah, you'll have um, a month to do all of them, inshallah. Okay. Um, yeah, register students have uh, the recordings access. So if you'd like to register, then you'll get all the recording access, inshallah, as well. Okay. So we'll conclude then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma inni as'aluka thabata fil amri wa as'aluka azimata rushd wa as'aluka shukra ni'matika wa husna ibadatik wa as'aluka lisana sadiqa wa qalban salima وأعوذ بك من شر ما تعلم وأسألك من خير ما تعلم وأستغفرك مما تعلم إنك أنت علام الغيوب